Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. Now that dust has settled on the Senate election, we have our sixth Senate. Uh, in this episode, we look forward to ask whether the party should be happy with the results, what the opposition parties plan to do now they've been elected, and what Mark Drakeford and his brand new cabinet will do with a working majority. Joining me and Kerry to discuss this and more, we have David Tristan Davis, Chair of Wales Active Travel Board, Board Member of Sports Wales and former Plaid Cymru Chair. Hello, David. Hi there. Uh, we have Alina Parrett, Head of Wales at the Institute of Physics and former member of the Senate between 2011 and 2016. Hello, Alina. Hi there. Hello there. And we've got Meg Thomas, Policy and Research Officer at Disability Wales and co-founder of That's Devolved. Hello, Meg. Hiya. Thanks for being here with us today. First and foremost, how do you think each of the parties are feeling after the election? Should they be happy, satisfied with their results or have they got something to worry about? Uh, David, what, what do you think? Pretty obviously, the Labour Party should be very happy. Everything they wished for probably came came true on election day. Every ounce of 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 credit and uh, cautious work that Mark Drakeford had done over twelve months was repaid at the ballot box, and no one was no one was really sure whether that would happen, because voters can be an ungrateful bunch at times. Um, and in this instance. In this, in this instance, they chose to express um, their gratitude for a job well done. Plaid so so. I mean, made some made some progress, but clearly the loss of the Totemic Ronda was a problem. And the Conservatives, again, I would have thought, given given their success in certainly in the northeast of England and in other parts of England, they would have hoped to run better. So that's my, those are my starters on the on those three anyway. Alina, what do you think? Obviously, as a, a former Lib Dem, definitely could have been worse. I'm still a Lib Dem. I'm just a former oh, sorry, um, Lib Dem representative. Sorry, of course, of course. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, there's an element of mixed feelings about it for the Lib Dem. So, you know, I am personally hugely delighted that Jane Dodds has uh, been elected to the Senate. She is one of the most genuinely caring people I know. I am thrilled for her but we perhaps would have wanted to see progress rather than just about to clinging on to to a seat in terms of other parties i think you know i agree with uh, david uh, to an extent i think plaid cymru uh, perhaps um would be more disappointed than he'd uh, give away um because they expected big things of adam price and Adam Price has not uh, come across as well with the voters as perhaps some of his um, cheerleaders would have said. Um, Leanne, I think, um, was a very personable leader. Um, and I think that perhaps that was, a, in hindsight for them, that was a mistake. She's certainly a loss to the Senate. It was a huge loss to the Senate. Meg, what do you think? Obviously, Labour will be over the moon with this result. No one was really anticipating Labour doing as well as they did, although... You know, you could you could have an argument about how well they have done in the responding to the pandemic overall. There was a concern about with the vaccine bounce, would that primarily benefit the conser the Conservative Party? But yeah, so Labour I think are very very happy. There was a very good, very strong mandate for Mark Drakeford now, which I think before, especially as he came midterm and hadn't really had an election to prove himself in yet. There was still almost that kind of like instability, but now there was very much like a strong backing for him. I agree with a lot of what we've been said before, but I think for Plaid, there was clearly a lot of disappointment about how far they've moved since 2016. So for Plaid to really get to where they need to be, they need to be holding places like the one that need to be ex expanding in the South Wales Valleys. Anything in that area is really needs to be something to hold on to. And there was also Cardiff West, which has been a key target, which has been a key target, which now we've seen an increase in 10,000 for Mark Drakeford's majority. So I can see a lot of disappointment and pride and the Conservatives. Although historically speaking, it's supposed to be a really, it's actually a good night for the Conservatives and they did well in comparison to their previous performances but I think again it was just there was a like a kind of a glimmer of opportunity in this election and where you found people who would never think to vote Conservative before actually voting Conservative in 2019. I think there was a bit of disappointment that they couldn't recapture that and also a bit of 
disappointment, I think, it, with their UK party generally, for kind of not really giving the support. And then also in some areas in the pandemic, kind of showing them up or going back on Welsh Conservative policy. And David, you, were very, you kept that very close to your chest when you when you talked about Plaid Cymru, so I'm going to push you a little bit on that. I'm sure you've seen over the weekend an article by Theo Davis-Lewis, who's a friend of the pod in The National, saying that Plaid are basically a glorified pressure group. Obviously, you probably disagree as the former party chair, but do you think there's any validity in, in those sort of accusations that Plaid's role is more about statecraft and pressing other governments into getting what they want rather than forming a government of their own? Some of you will be too uh, will be too young to remember the uh, the late great Professor Phil Williams, who served as an Assembly member in the first Assembly term, and Phil Phil was quite a character. He was a Plaid Cymru AM for the South East, and he lectured in Aberystwyth in astrophysics. And at one point, he said to me, "Look, David, to be honest with you, I don't care what how Plaid Cymru do in elections. If Labour get fifty percent of the vote and Plaid Cymru get five percent, and we become independent, I'll be delighted." If, on the other hand, Plaid Cymru get 50% of the vote and we deliver independence, I'd also be delighted. Either which way, I'm happy. Now, I, I, I suspect Phil was, was over-egging it a, bit, a little, but not too much, because that was, that was his genuinely held view, which he expressed um, in his characteristically eccentric way over, over several years. I think it gets to something about Plaid Cymru which is that for at least a chunk of the party membership, it is about as much about sort of creating that change as it is about sort of winning elections. And that can be, that can be really frustrating if you're chief executive of the party, I can tell you from bitter experience. But there is something there that that kind of broader sort of national movement thing is, is important to apply. On the other hand, of course, if you don't get votes and if you don't sort of win any elections, then then you, you don't make progress. There needs certainly to be a long, hard look at places, as, as Meg said, like, like the Ronda. I don't think we should dwell too much on Cardiff West because I think there's a set of very peculiar circumstances, shall we say, about that constituency in the last election. But places like the Ronda and Caerphilly, I mean, my hometown of Aberdeer, I think those are areas that Plaid should definitely be making progress in if it wants to make further progress electorally. And there was very little of that to be seen in this election. The truth is that actually I think this election has been a really interesting demonstration of Wales growing up as a devolved nation. Um, the very first um, edition of the National, I'm a sponsor, I'm very proud to be, is that, you know, said what difference has the pandemic made to devolution? And the truth is that it has shown that there are clear dividing lines between Wales and Westminster. And that means that people understand devolution, or at least they're aware of it more than they've ever been before. Even in England, when they knew that they couldn't come over the border on holiday even in England people are starting to take notice of Wales as a devolved nation and Wales wins when that happens Wales as a whole wins but also actually you know the cause of people who believe in devolution believe in greater powers like my own party and parties who believe in you know ultimately independence they have won from an election which was fought on Welsh issues rather than British ones for a change. Peg as the co-founder of That's Devolved you probably have some thoughts on whether this was a uh truly devolved election. Do you think this was a uniquely Welsh election for once? Um, I do think that it was significantly more of a uniquely Welsh election. Some of the first time you're seeing such a or such a visible role from the First Minister and from the Welsh Government, which you just haven't really seen, which you haven't really seen before, and you haven't really seen as much attention being paid to it. But from what we saw, there was a bit of an issue, especially within some aspects of the UK media, is that instead of it being report of it being reported as very specifically like Wales News or as reported as it would do stories from Westminster, it was almost used as a to contrast some of the some of what was coming out of England. And so it was not, it was never necessarily, this is specifically what's happening in Wales, is this is different to what is happening in England, or this is different to the UK. Yeah, I think the media both helps in, term, helps in terms of more vulnerable, 
mark, but I don't necessarily think it was really a fair representation of what was happening in Welsh politics. The media are not neutral in this um, and Meg and her uh, colleagues have been doing a fantastic job actually of educating the British media on what devolution actually means. But there is, there has been a, a tendency to portray um, the Welsh rules as being um, negative in some way by some of the British media or, you know, it was ridiculous that people couldn't go to their caravans or their holiday homes. No, it's, it wasn't ridiculous. And there is a reason why, um, you know, we have a government of our own to set rules for ourselves. And regardless of whether you agreed with those rules or whether they were proportionate or not, um, the electorate have um, seen that there was a difference. And I think that they have definitely made a choice based on that difference that they saw. Um, so the electorate as a whole, um, there are very vocal people who, who disagree, but the electorate as a whole are grateful. Meg and her team have done magnificent work. I also found it frustrating at times the lack of coverage of the Welsh election across the UK media. Scotland got a fair bit of coverage, but again, if you put it in the context of, say, um, the attention given to the US presidential election by, say, the BBC, for example, then we were nowhere, we were nowhere close. And actually, you could argue that the election in Scotland was potentially significant to the whole future of the state we live in. And yet there was nowhere near the, the level of coverage accorded there. And the Hartlepool by-election seemed to get as much mention, certainly initially, as, as the Welsh and Scottish elections did, so I think our, our sort of our friends in London need to need, need to need to think very carefully about that for the, for the, for the future, despite all the good work going on in Wales. It really goes to demonstrate what a lot of the major UK media sources view as their readership or view as their audience, because again, so much of the coverage in Scotland has been because it represents a change from England and from how Westminster works. And so it is just, it is kind of like an oddity to them. It is like, oh wait, this isn't Conservatives and Labour. This could be interesting to English readers or readers outside of Scotland because it is something unusual to them, which is also why I think the Welsh elections kind of got more coverage after they happened, as opposed to during them, because you had all of the, these articles going, wait a minute, so this Labour performed badly across, Engl uh, across England, but there has been this change, but there was a different in Wales, and they performed very, very well. So again, it's all about kind of like a reaction, or it's kind of like Wales and Scotland as like interesting, in interesting places to like illustrate what they believe is kind of like the norm. I, I think we could fill the whole pod with... Um... Your, all your thoughts on um, who did well, why, and the wherefores. But where do you think it leaves them all now for the, you know, it's going to be a long five years, I think, until we go here again. So, Leonard, what do you think, where do you think the parties will go from here? What will they be their priorities in this Senate term? So I think it, I mean, obviously it depends on the party. So Labour have got an opportunity to govern alone and uh, that they didn't expect to have. Um, they've written what I think is a quite a, a fairly cautious manifesto in many ways, but we are seeing um, some things coming out of it, which, um, you know, already early, we've got um, universal basic income going forward. Um, the Tories will want to attack that um, with um, all of their, their being. I think probably less so from other parts of the Senate where there is much more support. Uh, there is also the question of what does the future look like? When are we going to see past the pandemic? Where is the hope? Where is the growth? Where is the opportunity for our young people? When will my children be able to go to school and, and know that they're going again next week? You know, when will, um, you know, our our children be able to, to go to university and actually attend their lectures and do their practicals? People want to know what the future looks like for them. Um, but there is still this question of there is a, a, a really big job to be done on managing expectations for the short term future. So for this year, we can expect that there'll be a third wave. Um, we can expect that there will probably be more lockdowns as a result. We can hope that the vaccine rollout, which has been um, very effective in Wales, um, continues to protect people. Um, but people will want to see from the parties, they'll want to see hope. Something that I think is interesting from, La from Labour. I think in terms of like their policy priorities, I don't really see that much of a change from the last term. I think you're still going to see 
you're going to see a lot on the environment you can see a lot on uh, qualities hopefully some more stuff on housing and social care especially well there's the biggest change i think we're going to see attempt at a different way of working or an attempt to kind of like almost hark back to some of the early days of the senev with the new approach to politics i think we're going to see some of that i think we're going to see labor trying to take advantage of having a solely labor government to try and promote that or show that so in terms of like the conservatives are in a really interesting position because they are on they are the official opposition now in a place where their kind of like tactic during the pandemic has basically just been to kind of like disagree with everything that Welsh Labour has been putting forward and that hasn't worked. Publicly disagreeing with popular policies is not the best way strategy to go down but that's not what you saw in Andrew R.T. Davis's speech speech showing plenary. You see you saw something that's kind of a bit more conciliatory you can't saw something that's a bit more trying to build on something and you've got quite a lot of new interesting message joining the senate from on the conservative benches so i think we might see something quite different to from the conservatives to how they've been working more recently we were saying that that it's going to be a, a five it's going to be a long sort of five years until we're here again i'm not sure it's going to be that long because we've got two kind of periods, if you like. One is sort of the Mark Drakeford premiership. And then it'll be a new, it'll be almost sort of 18 months of a new Labour leader. I suspect it's three, three and a half years, new Labour leader, new ideas, dot, 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 and a kind of changing of the guard then. I would anticipate that there are a certain group of politicians close to Mark who may also think actually having served in the Senate for almost 30 years by that point, they may well think about retiring around the same time time as Mark. But Mark Drakeford, I think, becomes crucial then. He's got, there's there's an irony because Mark Drakeford doesn't sort of present himself as this sort of megalomaniac. Um, But actually, he's now got untrammeled power. I mean, he's got more power and influence than he's ever had at any point during his career. He's got this huge mandate from the electorate given that the manifesto doesn't say anything really i mean it's a, it's sort of a it was a manifesto drawn up that there could be flexibility in negotiations with whomsoever there was a need to negotiate with and suddenly there's no need to negotiate with anyone so they, um, mark drakeford can be entirely mark drakeford for the next 3 years and leave within within some bounds, whatever legacy he chooses. So, I mean, my suspicion is the UBI pilot reflects Mark's sort of personal politics, and it suddenly more or less popped up from from nowhere in terms of the Labour Party manifesto. It wasn't sort of a headline pledge in the Labour Party manifesto. So, so I I, I think watch watch Mark Drakeford very closely, and we could see some really interesting things. The thing is, I mean, Mark Drakeford is, a, you know, a veteran policy nerd. So um, he's he knows the, the detail on, on lots and lots of things um, and he can pull things out of his back pocket. He's going to be a little bit cautious about doing that. But in terms of things like UBI, it wasn't a headline policy in their manifesto. It was in ours, um, but it's one of those things. Well, fine. Yeah. And uh, Kerry is gesticulating as well. It's a, it's a headline policy for a number of other parties. I think, you know, with this idea that the, there'll be a conciliatory tone in the in the new, in the new assembly i hope so because the last assembly was poisonous frankly with a lot of very black and white issues but i'll believe it when i see it a little bit because um you know one of the things i've noticed about the conservative group this time around is they have deselected and removed um a lot of the moderate voices a lot of the moderate voices have stepped down um you have a lot of candidates for um target seats were selected on the basis that they agreed with the abolition of the the uh, senath um there are questions to ask there about the character and the tone and the tenor of the Welsh Conservatives in the future. I think what's really interesting is though that what happened with people like UKIP in England, their voters went to the Conservatives. It seems that a lot of the UKIP supporters here in Wales went back to Labour instead of passporting across. But it does seem to me that the Conservatives have taken a strong tack to the right in order to um, to try and grab those voters back from UKIP. Um, and from my point of view, I think that they'll be they will be the the voice of the un, of the 
um, the voice of difficulty. They, they're, they're not going to sit down and say, yes, mark whatever you want. They are going to argue just like they did with all of the pandemic responses. And as you say, um, we're then um, promptly made to shut up when, when England did exactly the same. There, there is a point there, of course, about, about, about the attitude of the Conservatives. And ironically, of course, it was those Conservatives who were particularly hostile to devolution and who were particularly sort of flying the flag for that kind of muscular unionism who did particularly poorly in the elections too and succeeded in persuading people of different political views to lend their votes in some areas certainly to the Labour candidates to ensure to ensure their success so I think there is I suspect that there will be some thoughtful Conservatives at least who will look at those results and think hmm this didn't work out quite as we planned had the Conservatives won five constituency seats and had won Newport West and whatever, then we, we wouldn't hear the end of it, I think. But there may be some voices of caution too. The question is, David, who is providing that intellectual and an analytical heft now that people like David Melding are gone? Um, because they have lost um, some some really very gifted and intelligent people. Um, of course, we don't know, um, you know, the, the new generation are yet to, to show their colours. I'm sure that they um, also have their own um, gifts and experiences to bring. But there is a loss of experience there and a loss of some people who had a lot of respect um, and a lot of political capital within the Senate. So let's talk about the, the new cabinet. Uh, last week's reshuffle saw not only a change to a lot of the post holders, but also to the posts. What does everyone make of the new climate change department and the holders of those ministries? Uh, David, do you want to start us off? I think I should probably be very careful, given that, I, given that one of my roles is to chair a board that sits in that crime climate change department. Um, I, 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 I'd hope the ministers in, in sort of post-election uh, bonhomie will, will, will be happy to hear, so will, will be willing for me to give my own views on these things. And I emphasise they are my own views. I think it's a really interesting development. It kind of reminds me of, I was trying to think about that super ministry that Prescott got in 97 from Blair, which I think was the DTR, Environment, Transport, um, Regions, Housing, Planning, and all of, the, all of those kind of things. And it, it kind of feels a bit like that in terms of there's lots of meaty policy areas in there. Uh, and, of, and of course, Mark Drakeford has appointed um, Julie James, who's well respected, and, and Lee Waters, who's clearly both up and coming and very, very committed to a number of these issues. You, you could see some a lot coming from that department, and I suspect you could also see some fireworks too. I think the, the, the ministry that leapt out to, to me, and climate change, of course, is, you know, it's a and I'm really pleased to see the investment uh, in that department. It's a big, meaty department with two ministers. Um, it is not a, a minor change there. That is really quite a significant piece of work. But the other thing that really leapt out to me is um, to have a deputy minister specifically for mental health. And I really welcome Lynn Nagel's appointment. She has been a long serving um, member of the Senate, but also she's been very independent minded. She's she's chaired committees with great skill. She's an interesting member of the Senate. And I am, um, you know, I'm delighted for her personally, but I'm actually really pleased as mental health is something that's really important to me to see someone uh, like Lynn, who's a real campaigner and a real, you know, really um, tenacious be appointed to that role. Yeah, I'm actually very pleased to see uh, Julie James's new role. I'm really pleased to see the inclusion of climate change, housing, transport and planning together, because something that has been quite frustrating for me from a policy perspective is the almost like siloing of those diff of different areas of policy, which are so interconnected, you just can't do that, especially from my background in the disabled, in the disability equality. You, for example, you can't have accessible housing that's not that has no access to public transport. You can't have accessible housing without thinking of the planning of the roads and the streets and the and the proximity to towns and city centres and urban centres. And all of that needs to be sustainable and it needs to be built for the long term. So I'm really, really glad to see that. And also very happy to see Jane Hutt in, in a role in a new role of social justice. Something that in our manifesto we did call for a minister for equalities and equality social justice. We'll take that as a win. <laughs> and, uh, happy to see this is uh, very much front and centre of the new gov of the new government. It is something that 
especially during the pandemic, like we saw that so far 68% of COVID deaths have been disabled people. And we've seen a higher portion of people who are black or an ethnic minority, higher portion of deaths in those communities. We have seen massive impacts on women, massive impacts on LGBT people, and we've seen massive impacts on people of from different of from people from different incomes, people from lower incomes especially. And I think it's really important that this is being put front and center of the new government, and that is something that needs to be considered in every single thing that the new government does. I think one of the things that really has struck me over the last 18 months is, as you say, about health inequality and how that, that has manifested itself. But not just the existence of it, but people's attitude towards it has been very paternalistic. And there's been um, quite a lot of an element of blame to certain communities for um, allowing themselves to, to get COVID, which is, you know, disgraceful um, victim blaming, essentially. When we look at people from lower socioeconomic groups, when you look at people from different kinds of communities, there's a higher chance that they're going to be underhoused and living in cramped conditions. There's a higher chance that um, that they are uh, obliged to go to work in the kind of caring professions or in things that are contact like working in supermarkets. Um, there is far too quick um, an assumption of blame and far too slow um, a thought about all the reasons, the underpinning reasons why certain um, groups have been more um, vulnerable to COVID than others. And I think what I want to see from the um, from this new ministry is the the capacity to actually collect some data, to actually learn, to actually give us some reasons rather than um, making assumptions. Let's have some some decent evidence-based policy. Let's learn and let's show the world actually that um, social justice is about not blaming people for the lives that they find themselves in. I, I think one of the things that struck me and sort of almost scared me and I haven't fully realised this, during the pandemic there was this sort of discussion on mortality rates in Wales and it was odd and someone sensible who I who sort of from a statistical perspective perspective who's saying oh actually rates in Wales are lower and someone else from who was equally sort of had the same background saying rates in Wales are higher and what it came what it came clear to me when I looked into it was that mortality rates in Wales pre-pandemic were significantly higher than those across the border and that's kind of a, a real made me think about how how we how collectively we'd failed to grasp that uh, and to try and address it and for all of those reasons that Meg and Lynette have have set out there there's an enormous challenge challenge there for sort of civil society really in Wales. Um, can I throw one more other interesting ministry in I think um, well sorry is it interesting for me certainly and probably for maybe for maybe for, for listeners too the constitutional change the minister for Const the constitution Mick Antoniv I think that's a really interesting appointment because if anyone's read some of the stuff that's come out of the radical federalists and some of the things that have been published including in Mick's name there's some pretty far-reaching proposals there and I think it's a really that that's that's another one actually to watch in my view where 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 Mick clearly has strong views about sort of a, a a radical federalist future for the for the UK which raises all manner of interesting questions shall we say the future of the UK post Brexit I mean we see the Northern Ireland agreement um falling to pieces because of um the inability to to settle um the the rules around Brexit and food standards and things along those lines the future of the the UK is by no means certain and I think that we need to see um that develop in a really positive way I would like to see us move towards you know if we're going to if the UK is going to remain together it must be a partnership of equals and it absolutely isn't that now and we are going to need to have some really radical um, kind of conversations about the future constitution if this family of nations is going to stay together. Otherwise, I cannot see the UK existing in its current form um, for really for very much longer. How, how quickly that process will take, I don't know. But if Scotland goes, then, you know, I think that, that you know, it's, it seems to me, it seems reasonable that Wales will follow relatively quickly afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's almost also almost feels like Mark to kind of taking advantage of that new like that new power he has and that new kind of like backs all public support and public opinion behind him and like going to the Westminster government and Boris Johnson have been quite 
unsupportive to say the least of the attack of devolution and being always almost, it almost feels like a dare which is like a, we are having these conversations in wales like you do not only have to worry about scotland we are not attached to you and we have and we want to have some say over our constitutional future and we are willing to have those conversations at a higher level and it almost feels like just like a, a message to like don't feel comfortable you you have all kind of stolen some of the questions from the script there david so uh thank okay, you for sorry that. no 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 it's good it's good it's good that's what we, we, we'd like to see the the panel you know bringing these things to the fore so do, do you think mix appointments will will be a more or less openly antagonistic approach towards the UK government that uh, perhaps was the case when Jeremy Miles was exercising a similar position last year? I'd say more because um, it's just the personalities of the human beings. Um, Mick um, very much is, you know, he says what he he believes in and he's um, very proud to do so. Um, We can't, you know, I don't fault him for that in any way. Jeremy is very much more of a um, a kind of conciliatory voice, Um, you know, both skills that are um, equally necessary in politics, but they're a little bit different. Um, And I do think that we'll have much more open debate um, about the constitution as a result of mixed appointment. Also, I think like it's, it's something about expl- like how explicit it is being or how like clear it is like potentially from a more public facing view as Mick has been very openly discussing ideas about radical federalism recently and he's put out, you know, he's put out papers on this as was in the manifesto. Whereas I think with Jeremy's role, it was almost, it was more focused, it was kind of like more focused on Brexit and it was more focused, remember that, it was all focused on, far more like working with the UK government on a particular issue, whereas this is something that's a conversation that's just happening specifically in Wales, it's less, it's less of a back and forth and it's more of Wales saying this is what we want, that makes sense? That, that makes a lot of sense, Meg. And I think there's two, there's almost two tracks to this. It's sort of what happens in Wales. And of course, by now we do have some authority over some things we can change. We can change the size of the Senate. We can change the voting system, both of which put a, a flag in the ground here. I'd be disappointed to see if there was no progress on either in the next in the next Senate term. So I think there are opportunities there. I wonder, I wonder too, if Mark and Mick and the sort of the the Labour Party in Wales in their in their positioning in the Welsh Government around radical constitutional change may well have a significant impact on thinking within the Labour Party too. Because well, Mark's got that sort of, as I was describing it, some significant influence and power in Wales. He'll also be looked at, I suspect, within the Labour Party as someone who's actually won elections when more or less all about him were losing theirs. Um, so, so there are that also gives him some in, some influence, and maybe because of some of his thoughtful nature, he might be able to influence colleagues in other parts of the UK too. So, I'm, I'm, it's it, certainly interesting times constitutionally. One of the uh, one of the biggest uh, surprises, I think, for most people, was that Vaughan Gethin was moved out of health in in the middle of a pandemic. I think that was pretty much the only thing that Andrew R T Davis had to to criticise the reshuffle for, if I remember his press release. Do you think this is more motivated by what the health service will look like post pandemic than it is? how Vaughan has dealt with the pandemic per se? I don't think it's got much to do with how Vaughan has dealt with the pandemic because that's clearly been a Vaughan and Mark show, if you like. I mean, that's unprecedented challenges, all manner of things there. I, I, I mean, I think it's been fairly fairly publicly said Ken Skates wanted to step down, at which point who, who, who becomes the next economy minister? You want a big hitter. Um, I, I think you'd forgive anyone who'd who'd been health minister throughout the pandemic, of of on a, just on a purely personal level almost of of seeking other opportunities, and I just got to, I wonder if this was in the back of Mark's mind when he appointed Aleneed as a deputy health minister. What was it? Some six or nine months ago, and at the time it looked just oh, what you're going to have two deputy health ministers now. And she's going to keep the Welsh language, and it just looked a little bit odd. But actually, if it had been a plan for some time, 
to consider Alina as a health minister, then that that makes I mean it makes perfect I mean sound perfect sense. Get to know the department, get to know some of the key issues, um, and make progress from there. So so I I I I I'd sort of on a practical level, I think I I'd sort of there may be just those really simple practical explanations for it. Meg, it can't be a, an enviable task dealing with the health service post pandemic. It's going to be you know, there's going to be huge impact from, from the pandemic on waiting lists and the, the amount of people that doctors and nurses can see in patient care. Surely that will be a huge uh, daunting prospect for, for Leonard Morgan coming next. Absolutely. So we're already seeing issues with waiting times. We've seen people who've had their appointments delayed. We are already seeing like issues within the health system that have, have, have come about as a result of the pandemic, like Macmillan have been doing a lot of great work on the impact of the pandemic on cancer patients. And there is going to be some very serious issues and challenges for the health set for the health service following this. And not to mention there is a massive mental health crisis right on that right on the horizon. And that is from people and that is will be impact of isolation, but also I've heard some concern it's about the levels of PTSD amongst for, amongst first responders to the pandemic and the, some of the scenes that people have seen and felt during the response and we're going to there's going to be some massive massive challenges and I agree wholeheartedly with David yeah, it, it makes a lot of her appointment now makes so makes a lot of sense it's always kind of like just setting like grooming her priming her to be to be his successor and I also think it makes sense that she was specifically put into like a well-being kind of role because I think that the health sector is going to need to take take on and grasp well-being and well-being issues for the future because now we're coming like we're starting to slowly come more out of the pandemic now we people are getting their people are getting their vaccines I got mine on Friday so we're starting to move past or move beyond the work that Bourne is doing and I think yeah it's I think it is kind of like quite, I think it makes sense for now someone to step in to face the next series of challenges. I'm going to disagree slightly. I don't think that the pandemic is over. I don't think we're post pandemic yet. I think that, that we need to be prepared for the fact that the pandemic is probably going to be uh, having an effect for the next 18 months or more. Um, that's not necessarily major waves in the future, but there will be more waves and there will be new variants that we have to respond to. Um, that being said, um, I completely agree that the, the knock-on impact is um, devastating. I saw an article in the newspaper at the weekend um, about um, the fact that um, a, a huge number of children are being admitted to the, um, the Children's Hospital of Wales at the Heath um, for um, suicide attempts and they cannot, and CAMS are so understaffed that they cannot get people to see them. I, I know of cases where, you know, children have waited more than 18 months for their first appointment with a CAMS assessment, having been referred by their GPs. I know of um, patients that, you know, children who've been admitted to A&E um, who have um, been told that CAMS aren't going to come and see them and assess them because they're not urgent enough. So they've, you know, they are actively harming themselves and cannot be released home because it isn't safe to do so but cams don't don't have the capacity to visit those children that is um you know a crisis waiting to happen um you ask school teachers they will say that they've got um, many many young people not returning to school because they are not well enough um in terms of their well-being we have a significant problem but it's not just going to be in terms of health and mental health that problem is also going to spread across other sectors and i think education is going to see the impact of that as well also in waiting times and some of the things people aren't thinking about, so for example, waiting times for autism diagnosis, uh, diagnosis ADHD diagnosis, particular, diff particular different impairments, which also, again, have that knock-on effect to the to other aspects of your life. We're going to see such a big problem with waiting lists. Well, we already are. And I, I suspect in a way, and, and those, those comments reflect maybe a broader crisis that may hit us soon is that 
I, I, my, my view is one of the things the pandemic has illustrated is the lack of resilience within the pub, lack of resilience within systems and in the public sector. And what I mean by that isn't the enormous resilience that's been shown by staff and all those things, but suddenly when the panda, pandemic hit, sort of waiting list shop is shoot, shooting up, teachers were put under an enormous strain, sort of health systems were creak, I mean, literally creaking this, this time last, last year and again and again in the middle of the winter. Um, because the whole of the public sector discourse had been focused around, oh, well, we have to be really efficient. So we're going to close all these wards. We're only going to have sort of efficient hospitals. And we're only gonna... everything comes down to this sort of view of, of efficiency. And we're not, whereas actually having that capacity to think and to deal with things, and it, it does build some resilience, it does build resilience into organisations. Um, which would have been really useful during the pandemic. And I, I, I've sort of seen it um, on a really local level with some of the mutual aid support groups. It was those organisations that had resilient capacity that were able to sort of step up and then to offer more in. Um, and I think there's something there about how we run our public services, how we think about our public services, how we conceive of them. I mean, that's a... <laughs> That's another whole, that's another series of podcasts, but I think there is something there, isn't there? Sorry, Alina. I was just going to say that, you know, and people need to understand that resilience is is not about buildings. It's not about structures. It's about people. Um, the, the NHS uh, probably has the physical building space to have coped, um, but they are struggling to find staff. And if we don't protect and care for and look after the staff that we've got, then we're going to face a really significant crisis. You can't... Um, pit, pluck a, a fully qualified nurse or doctor out of the air. Um, they um, take a long time to train. They are people who are, you know, dedicated and committed. And if we um, treat them in such a poor way that they feel that their their dedication has not been recognised and they become demoralised, then we will lose them. We're seeing exactly the same thing in the teaching profession. Record numbers of teachers leaving the profession at this point in time, because we've had people assuming that they're they've not been working at all during the pandemic when you know the, the the, the opposite is absolutely true that they have been desperately trying to get hold of young people who are um, you know vulnerable and at home um, with their parents trying to understand and make sure that they're getting the support they need it has been a different job but it hasn't been no job um, and we have um, you know a crisis um, but it's a people crisis not a buildings or a places crisis we need it's not physical infrastructure it's you know, understanding human beings and giving them the opportunity to um, to do what they they love um, in a in an appropriate environment. This is almost understanding the needs of healthcare and exactly everything that goes into healthcare. So we so there needs to be more support. There needs to be more accessible, safe, quality housing. There needs to be more access to green spaces. We need to start tackling air quality. We need to start looking at things and issues and also some of the issues which the say which disabled people come up across uh, against time and time again is that there's this was over medicalization of pretty much everything <laughs> and there needs to the social indicators of health are vital and extremely important and there needs to be a lot of emphasis put on the put on these in the next term so that, that actually brings me to one of my uh, wrap-up questions um you know the, the policies are now what we want to want to go and see to be delivered and we've mentioned the ubi pilot and uh i was reading the the report on the scottish um pilot earlier today and I, i've got no doubt that what's been announced in wales is actually giving civil servants nightmares at the moment because it is it is going to be hard to do something with that meaningfully but it, we've got ubi on the table and it, it's got a lot of the headlines but where else do you think this Labour government now with a, a good mandate and possible support across parties might go in policy uh, directions. Do you think local government might be on the table? Or you mentioned green spaces, but also the staffing in uh, the public sector, Leonard. You know, what do you think might be a focus now? they've actually got to start delivering some of the things that they've previously promised so we've got a new curriculum for wales which is coming in in september and we need to see the detail of that that is one of the most radical changes to the um, education um, portfolio um but it's by no means um set in stone how that's going to happen and you know from my with my hat on and from the institute of physics we are really you know 
concerned that if we don't have the, the, the qualified teachers and the, the right content in there, that young people um, could have a very varied um, experience of education. So that needs to be really settled out and there's some delivery to be done there. In terms of other policy areas, not just having um, people for things like social policy and mental health, but actually having an agenda for change for social policy and mental health, I think is really important. So, you know, as someone who is autistic myself, um, and I've got an autistic child, we see challenges in the way that services are delivered for people with disabilities. We see how that becomes a barrier to your everyday life. Um, but whilst there's a lot of warm words and a lot of people wishing to be understanding, what there hasn't ever been is a lot of action to, to change those barriers, to remove them. Um, and so we need to, to, to move beyond intentions and actually see some delivery. Um, we, one, my biggest criticism of the, the previous Labour governments that we've had is that they've been really good at writing a strategy, um, but they write a strategy, they spend five years writing a strategy and give themselves about two months to deliver it. We need to see some delivery now. Agreed. And we need to see some big, serious changes in social care. We need, like, very much desperately, we need to see the social, social care really working with disabled people and really working with people to, adequate, to adequately provide less support needs. So we need to see more availability of direct, of direct payments so that people can have some more, more control over the, over this and also more support for people because like when you are taking a direct payment and hiring someone you become an employer there needs to be more support on that side for people as well there needs to be more set more things set up to make sure that it's really working for people working for people and there's an understanding of exactly what is this service meant to do yeah i, th I, I think there's um i think those all of those points are really strongly made. I, I share Alina's frustration about the lack of delivery. I, I'd throw in to housing and I think um, I, I think there are specific areas about sort of there are specific problems with the lack of affordable housing and particularly in, in city areas but I do wonder post pandemic too um, I'm speaking to friends and colleagues out in Ceredigion and they're reporting that house prices are rocketing up and I, I mean I always say when somebody says that, let's wait for the land registry prices so we can see what's actually happening to the prices that are being paid. But, I mean, I suspect there's an element of truth in it because people may well be either choosing to go home or, or to sort of work out that actually you can, if you can work from home from Aberaeron and sort of go occasionally to Cardiff or London, then that's a very nice place to work from home, isn't it? So I, I think there's an interesting post-pandemic um, sort of societal change there that we've got to be, that that could be, dis I mean, in a funny way, that could be disastrous for the local house, local housing stock because you've got people who will have significantly higher higher purchasing power, making it almost impossible for, for th those younger people who may not have such purchasing power to, to get, get on the housing ladder. So I think there are, there are, so if the government can do can address half of those, they'll be doing well. <laughs> I tell you what, though, Dav, is, uh, you know, if people do move, if people's behaviour in terms of their home changes um, as a result of the pandemic, then that has a massive knock on impact on, the, on other kinds of services. Transport's the one that people always, um, you know, jump to immediately. But think about, you know, we need GPs in, you know, going to need more GPs, going to need more school places in rural Wales if people are going to commute less often. And, and definitely that's what my organisation is talking about. Let's, let's not spend our life um, on the train um, so much. Let's spend our life doing what we are supposed to be doing it's very it's, you know it's very fitting that Kerry wrapped on a very high uh high thinking policy question I'm going to bring us right back down to earth with a horrible political question to to finish there are 18 new members of the senate now there's a lot of discussion about whether this will be Mark Drakeford's last ever reshuffle or whether he's maybe got one more in him depending on how long he stays in term but if he does have one more reshuffle in him or if he, even if he doesn't, who do we think will be, you know, the new Labour members uh, who find their way into the next cabinet? Who do you think is a one to watch in terms of progression into the cabinet? And more broadly speaking, of all of the new members of the Senate, are there any there that have taken, you know, have caught your eye in, in the last few days or you know from before that you think are going to make a real impact in this next Senate? 
In terms of Labour members, I think Sarah Murphy is definitely someone to watch. She's someone who's done a lot of work uh, around Bridge End and is quite very popular there. And I think she's definitely someone to keep an eye on in the Senev and also Carolyn Thomas for up in North Wales. I think definitely already we already see it starting to see some interesting stuff coming out of her. And then in terms of some of the other uh, so of the parties, uh, again mentioned it earlier, Natasha Asgar is definitely someone to watch. I think she's going to do some interesting things in the centre of and Mabon Apwinvel in Clyde. It's got quite a strong political background and I think it's definitely someone who's going to try and make some waves. I can agree with some of Meg's points now. I, I think Sarah Murphy is probably the Labour, the, the Labour member to watch. Um, I think what's more in I mean, what may be more interesting is is who the next first minister might appoint to cap senior cabinet level, um, and there there may be some there may be some people there in the deputy ministerial ranks who are, are looking to promotion, um, while there's maybe some looking towards the end to, more towards the end of their career. So I I um, I keep an eye on them. I think I mean. Those of you who haven't come across Mabon yet, I think will will be highly impressed with him, because not only is he clearly very political, but he's all, he's also a very collaborative and cooperative person. He's a kind of thinker. He's sort of Sean Ed Williams, Plecumry, South Wales West is very impressive and certainly certainly one to watch. I I admit I don't know very much about him, but I saw an interview with Sam Kurtz recently. Um, uh, when he was elected, and and he said, "Oh, I want to make it absolutely clear, I am a Welsh Conservative, not a Conservative in Wales," which I thought was an interesting <laughs> formulation, <laughs> given given the tenor of the Conservative campaign and the sort of the new Conservative group. So I'll I'll, I'll pick him as my one 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 to watch on the Conservative benches. Elena, what do you think? I'll be watching Buffy Williams to see how she gets on. Um, in terms of people who might look to cabinet appointments or ministerial appointments in the future, um, I'm wondering, although I know that um, he's uh, not necessarily the, the most um, diplomatic soul on the, on the earth, I wonder why uh, Heaven David hasn't um, got a promotion previously. Um, he's, a, you know, he, he's a knowledgeable uh, person, got some experience in the economy, so he might have been a good pick there. In terms of uh, members of the other parties, obviously I'm going to be um, uh, you know, gunning for, uh, you know, looking for Jane Dodds and seeing what she does, particularly around social care, because that really is her area of expertise, um, health and uh, the social services. Um, I also, um, I think, as I say, the Conservatives are going to be interesting as a group dynamic, aren't they? Because they've got so many new people and so many new people from a particular viewpoint. It will be really interesting to see how that goes. It was not um, a pleasant end of term for quite a few people. Um, and I think that um, that for me is the one to watch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one last quick one in. Matt's far too polite to ask any of you. But... You know, you you mentioned about how Mark has moved people around, perhaps in preparation for for bigger ticket items, but he's he's now got three big players at three of the big portfolios in education, um, health, and the economy. And as the election was recently fought on Mark's kind of reputation and his leadership, but we all know that he isn't going to be there throughout this term. So, who who are you, who's the early money on David with your betting hat on for the next Labour leader? Uh, I think you 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 should bet with great caution on parties you're not overly familiar with their internal dynamics. However, I'd say this: um, in the last five years, one of the most impressive speeches I have heard was given by Jeremy Miles. He turned up to a Wales for Europe event, um, and he could quite easily—I mean, about two years ago now—he could quite easily have rocked up and said, "Oh, I'm in favour of Europe," which he is, and these are the good reasons for Europe. And actually, he came and gave a really thoughtful, challenging speech about why we'll, uh, why the European sort of campaign had failed, and what were the challenges for the future. That really impressed me. So, um, as stands, I mean, that 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 stood out for me as sort of something I wasn't necessarily expecting from a government minister with a sort of fairly easy crowd. Um, he took that on and, and that impressed me. So, so I, 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 if, you, if you forced me into betting, I'd say you, 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 you'd, you'd um, be wise not to bet against uh, Jeremy Miles. 
I think he's a canny bet as well. I really do. I think um, he's got, I mentioned a little bit earlier about his dis- diplomacy. He's got the ability to um, bring people together a little bit, which is interesting. Um, obviously, I'm going to, you know, shout out to, to my namesake, um, Aline Ed Morgan as well. Cards on the table, I'm a member of the Labour Party. And so something that I think is going to be interesting is going to depend a lot on the membership and what that looks like and who and which candidates particularly appeal to membership. I've heard, like, I again, I wouldn't bet against Jer- Jeremy, at least not him having a, enough nominations to stand. I also think Vaughan has got a good shot, especially as he's basically left the health portfolio at, at a perfect time for a, for, for a leadership run. And also Rebecca Evans is someone who's just basically been very, very quietly senior in the Welsh government for quite a long time and really seems to have a good relationship with Mark Drakeford so that might, so she's definitely another person to watch and of course Aluna Ed Morgan I think what she does with health is definitely going to be telling because at the moment it could either be an incredible break and it could be a fantastic way of getting your name out there to people who would probably may have never heard you before but it, could, it is going to be a very, very challenging time to be health minister. Uh, well, thank you all so much for coming to talk to us today. If you want to find out more about what you've got to say, uh, where can they find you? Perhaps on Twitter, Meg? You can find me on Twitter at, at Megan Leah Thomas or at That's Evolved. David? And at David Tristan on Twitter. Fantastic. Elined? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Elined underscore Parrot with two T's. Wonderful. Thank you very much for, for talking to us, like I said. And if you want to find more about what we do here at Hero, please don't forget to find us on Medium at Hero Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Hero Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Hero Blog. Thank you for listening to Hero. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.